Hello and uh, welcome to our study on intercession and uh, we thank you so much for joining us and uh, looking forward to this time. Sorry for the delay. I know it's been a couple of weeks since we've had a new, uh, a new segment, but uh, we want to send our greetings here from uh, uh, Omega, Texas, all the way to all the Omegas who are listening and watching, viewing this. Uh, in different parts of uh, of the world, and so um, we we greet you there in Mombasa, Pastor Eric and uh, Omega Mombasa, uh, all of the Omegas in uh, in India, the Mumbai area, and Pastor Bopani, Pastor Susan, um, and there are so many Pastor um, uh, Kofi there in uh, in uh, uh, the Ivory Coast and uh, Omega there also with. Uh, Pastor Forrest in, uh, in California, we, we welcome you to this. And uh, please, as always, uh, begin to share this video. Uh, we want to get this into the, um, the, as many churches as possible that uh, they can begin to build their, their intercessory teams. It really is going to be imperative as we continue on in, in this era that churches have uh, a couple of things. And one of them is going to be a powerful, strong um, ministry of intercession. And uh, the second is going to be that uh, churches are, uh, have a biblically balanced uh, deliverance ministry as well. So we're, we're, we're inviting you to be a part of this and share these things with, um, with, with your churches. Praise the Lord. So tonight uh, we are going to welcome you. Let's, uh, let's pray together as a body and just ask the Lord to prepare our hearts. And then we're going to move into our, uh, our study. Holy Spirit, you're welcome and I ask for your anointing to be here in this place upon all who are listening and hearing, no matter when they listen and when they hear. We ask for your anointing to be upon this, uh, this teaching. And I ask uh, for you to, to speak to us and to change our lives by the principles of your word and by the power of your spirit. Let us not just hear these things and uh, go on about our business, but uh, use these, these principles of your word, these precepts, use them to change us and to strengthen your church. And now I, I seek you, Spirit of God, and your involvement upon my heart and life. Let me say the words that need to be said in this segment. Uh, not too many and not too few, but let me communicate the concepts that you've given us to thrive in intercession within your church. And uh, let me do your word uh, justice uh, for your character and your essence. And we ask these things, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So tonight I want to begin to speak to us about um, the weapons of our warfare in uh, intercession. We've talked a lot about the priesthood, about developing burdens, how to maintain the characteristics of an intercessor, and now we want to move into the actual force of what it is that we are carrying about. And uh, I'm going to begin with speaking um, uh, on the subject of, of tongues. And so we want to, we want to talk about that. I know that this is um, a concept that um, still divides many in the church. We're going to talk about that some tonight. Uh, this is not meant to be something that is divisive, nor is it meant to be something that is condemning. This is meant to be something that allows us to see uh, the larger picture of what the Spirit of God has intended for humanity uh, from Genesis all the way through. So um, I want to open with a question tonight, and I want you to, to be able to answer this and begin to look at this inside of yourself. And the question is this, how often do you pray in tongues? How often do you pray in tongues? And uh, uh, periodically over the years in different congregations and different groups that I've ministered with, uh, I've asked this question and uh, I've asked it to different staff members over the years. And uh, inevitably, I am uh, met with something that is no longer a surprise to me, uh, but is, is just a matter of fact sort of thing. And, and there are many Pentecostals in the body of Christ who only pray in tongues during church service, uh, during a time of praise or during a, uh, uh, a time at the altar or when they are praying in the house of God, uh, that becomes the thing that they are, are, uh, are involved in. And so I, I, I ask you to be mindful of the timings inside of your heart and life in which you are praying in tongues. And with that, I want to say another, um, just a, a, an awareness for the body of Christ. Now, for everything that is out there that is real, Satan is trying to destroy it. Can we, can we agree upon that? 
Satan sees the power that is behind a concept that God has created for our benefit and he is trying to destroy it. For example, there is benefit to the family unit as described throughout scripture. So what does Satan come along? He tries to destroy or tear down in every culture what a family unit is. And he does that to a varying uh, you know, degrees of success because he knows if he can keep people back from what God has uh, promised us as his, as his best for humanity, that then we fall short in being satisfied. He knows that that creates uh, uh, disunity. He knows that it creates uh, uh, difficulties inside of our lives. And that, that's what he's after, turmoil and chaos and confusion. So um, with, with regard to tongues, I also want to lay out this concept that is, that is present. I know that there are individuals who have spoken in tongues and they are filled with the Holy Spirit, but I have also heard many in Pentecost in this generation, you know, because obviously this is the generation I live in, so that's what I would hear, uh, but I've heard many people who speak in tongues who are simply repeating something that they've memorized from years past. I want us to be mindful of that that when those utterances begin to flow, that we are not just starting off with some uh, unintelligible syllables that are going through there, and we're not just saying something, but it needs to be fueled from within. Now, I don't say this to condemn us. I don't say this to cause you to be afraid of speaking in tongues. God is big enough to sort these things out. But what I am seeking is that which is genuine. I'm seeking that which is pure, that which is on target, because that's where the benefit is for the body of Christ as well as for individuals within that body. Much of what I've heard around the altars in the last 10, 15 years, and I've been pastoring for a lot longer than that, but much of what I have heard has simply been something that they are going off of a remembrance of things that they had experienced decades ago. And so there's lots of, of gibberish, if I would say that, that is out there. And where there is gibberish, there is no power and there is no spirit of the Lord. That does not mean that the individual is on their way to the lake of fire. It just means there needs to be some education and some opportunities that say, hey, let the times of refreshing come. Let the Spirit of God move upon your heart and life so that that genuine language can begin to rise up inside of you because there is great power when the Spirit of God prays through you. Amen? Amen. Okay. So um, I, I just want you to be aware of how often do you speak in tongues and, and, and what instance. I'm going to submit to you that the, the believer in Christ uh, should be speaking in tongues on a frequent basis filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say daily, you should be praying in tongues. You should have time uh, where, where you're entering into that relationship where the Spirit of God just bubbles up within you and you're allowing the Spirit of God to pray through you. Uh, but nor do I want to set some sort of pattern that uh, if you are falling short of that, that somehow Satan is coming in and condemning that. Okay, Paul said it this way, I praise the Lord that I speak in tongues more than you all. Amen. So uh, this is what this is what Paul is is after. Um, this is what the Spirit of God is after. Uh, Romans chapter eight verse twenty six. I want to give three scriptures here quickly. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So this is not just talking about a prayer language. This is talking about the Spirit given utterances or groanings that are too deep. There is a place that you can come to an intercession where you do not have the words to say in your native language what it is that the Spirit of God is trying to pray through you, but in our weakness, the Spirit of God can pray through us. We don't know how to pray as we ought. Amen? So, what happens? God has provided a mechanism so that our flesh doesn't have to get in the way. It bypasses the flesh and our spirit is able to communicate to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit. Amen? Now, please, we're going to take this in context. This does not mean that every word that you have needs to be prayed out in the spirit. Okay, Paul says also, I pray with the Spirit, I also pray with the understanding. Okay, so this does not mean that every syllable that you utter needs to be prayed in, in the Spirit. With all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So we're talking about intercession here. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit or by praying in the Holy Spirit. How do you build yourself up in your faith? How do you become more mature? By praying in the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
So this is a weapon that allows the Spirit of God to build you when you are praying in the Spirit. So this is a valuable thing. Jude uh, chapter 1, obviously one chapter there, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. There's the phrase again. The early church, the New Testament church, had as its foundation the concept that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and in particular praying in tongues, was of great benefit to you. It was of great benefit to the church. This is something that I, I am concerned is not being taught nor encouraged in the body of Christ in our generation. How can we step into the things of God if we aren't using the language that God has given us post-salvation to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues? And I know there are some out there that think that this is gone and done away with. We're going to discuss that as we move through here. Um, <clears throat> Acts chapter uh, 2 um, uh, tells us, we'll read the scripture in a moment and have it on the screen in a few moments, but it talks about uh, that on the day of Pentecost, uh, the Spirit of God, uh, and I'll say this, it is the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, sometimes I like to continue to add that Holy Spirit of God in there because uh, I, I believe that um, the body of Christ needs to mature and the body of Christ needs to understand that God is holy, His Spirit is holy. Uh, he's not looking for a casual relationship. He's not looking for a relationship in which uh, we continue with our old lives and our old emotions and uh, um, it come to my attention during the, the past week that um, you know someone that I'm acquainted with uh, has been talking uh, <clears throat> a lot about how in the past, you know, I just realized I couldn't be good enough. I couldn't do the right things by God. I, I had set this standard and God's standard was just too high. And oh, what changed everything for me was the love of God and understanding that God loves me as I am and so on and so forth. And I agree with absolutely all of that. But let me add this. Just understanding the love of God does not change that he is a holy God. It does not lower the standards to which he has called us, nor does it decrease the power of the Holy Spirit to come on the inside of us and transform us. So many individuals are talking about the love of God and the grace of God as an excuse to continue to wallow in weakness and infirmity and sin and not reigning in their emotions and so on and so forth. I'm glad I got that off my chest. I feel a whole lot better. I hope you do as well. Uh, but... <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, it says they all spoke in tongues as the, they were baptized in the Spirit. Uh, this, this phrase, spoken tongues, uh, I'm going to give you the definition from a Greek and English lexicon because I am not a Greek uh, uh, scholar, so I, I have to resort to things like this. And it says simply this, it's an utterance having the form of language but requiring an inspired interpreter for the understanding of the content. An ecstatic language, a tongue, ecstatic speech. So by definition only, I need to delineate a couple of things. Is it true that when you speak in other tongues, that it is also speaking in human languages that can be understood by other individuals? The first answer to that question is yes, that is true. We know on the day of Pentecost when they were all gathered, there were people there from all over the world. Uh, why? Because it was one of the festivals they had to attend. So Jews from all over the world had come back to Jerusalem. But they heard these men speaking in their, their native languages of their, uh, their home countries even though they were not learned languages, okay? Uh, I, have, uh, I have had instances in, 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 uh, in which that has happened to me where I've been speaking at altars uh, and, and, and speaking to individuals and praying in tongues and uh, individuals later told me, you're speaking in my dialect, you know, and, and it's a dialect that I, I'd never known and they understood in their dialect what I was saying and all I was doing was allowing the Spirit of God to pray through me. However, I have also had a different experience where I was praying and it it was not in a language that was known to humankind as far as I know. Uh, and I've had other individuals come alongside and say afterwards that although they did not know what I was saying, uh, the Spirit of the Lord gave them an interpretation and what they heard was it being translated into their language. Uh, so I, I've seen it on, on, both, on both sides. So I don't want to get hung up tonight 
on whether or not, because there are people who record people speaking in other tongues and saying, this is just gibberish, it's no known language that we've ever had here. Look, I believe that God is able to deposit languages inside of humanity that humanity uh, hasn't studied or known. Uh, they may have been uh, popular on the face of the earth. They may be heavenly languages that nobody's known yet, except for those who are in heaven. So I don't get hung up on that. I hope that you guys don't as well. Um, in part, I, I, I just, it blows my mind to see how something that God meant to, to create unity in the body of Christ has become such an object of division. Speaking in other tongues is designed by God to bring the body back into unity. And we're going to discuss this uh, at, at length here this evening. To do that, I have to set a table and lay some foundation here so you know the, uh, about the statements I'm about to make. Now, we hear the term charismatic. Are you familiar with that term? I think it's familiar. People all over the world have heard this term. Charismatic simply means grace gifted. Okay, that's what charismatic means. Charismatic does not mean Pentecostal. It does not necessarily mean spirit filled. It means grace gifted. Okay. Uh, Pentecost simply means 50th. 50th. The term Pentecost means 50th. So if you are Pentecostal, you celebrate the 50th. Now, why, what does this come, where does this come from in Scripture and what does this mean in Scripture? In Scripture, it was one of the feasts, the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of the 50th. What in the world is that? It was because Pentecost, on the day it fully arrived, was exactly 50 days past Passover. It was the festival that was announced. You count 50 days from Passover to here. And God says, uh, there's another festival that I want you to be present at. And uh, uh, that, that's, the, that's the festival of Pentecost. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16 says this. It was part of the law for all of Israel. Three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose at the feast of unleavened bread and at the feast of weeks and at the Feast of Booths, three feasts. Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's Passover. Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. Feast of Weeks is uh, 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 Harvest or, or, or Pentecost. And then the Feast of Booths is the Feast of Tabernacles towards the end of the year. Then they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So, three feasts that all men were required to celebrate before the Lord. You were uh, uh, celebrating God three times a year. You made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. This was the place that God has chosen. Uh, one of them is going to be in March or April, and that's Passover. Many individuals would simply stay until uh, uh, the Feast of Weeks or Harvest, which is Pentecost, 50 days after that. And then there's the Feast of Tabernacles that happens in September or October of every year. And that's the, the concluding festival. The harvest is celebrated as being completed. So God wanted built into the yearly calendar of all of the Israelis. God wanted built in there this, this, this uh, three feasts inside of the year. Now, these three feasts are corresponding to New Testament realities. So just because we are not called to celebrate the feast and sacrifice the animals and travel to Jerusalem, praise the Lord, you know, just because we aren't called to do those things doesn't mean they don't have import inside of our hearts and lives. Passover corresponds to salvation. It's the shedding of the lamb. It signifies Egypt uh, or Israel coming out of Egypt, the uh, blood of the lamb over the doorpost. You stayed in the house, you were rescued. The firstborn wasn't destroyed. That's what God used to extricate Israel out of bondage. Okay. Then later, there's the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks as it's called. Those two um, uh, phrases would be used synonymously there. This was 50 days afterwards and it was to commemorate the start of of the grain harvest, the wheat harvest, okay? And then towards the end of the harvest, when all the wheat was brought in, all the fruit was brought in, all the olives were brought in, then you have the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths, and that was when they all built uh, uh, makeshift uh, tents, if you will, out of palm leaves and those things, and they commemorated, we dwelled with God in the wilderness, and God brought us safely to the promised land. Yes, amen. That's also called the Feast of Ingathering. The significance, you've got salvation, you've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
and you've got the taking away of the church or the catching away of those who belong to God to live with God forever and ever again uh, in, in glory. So you've got the, 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 the final end of the church. All three of those commemorated in Scripture, built into the calendar of Israel, uh, and there are, are the three things that God's saying, you have to keep these things inside of our heart and life. Now, what the church has done in many respects around the world has just asked that we keep the first one, salvation, and then we're looking forward to the last one. But there are many people in the body of Christ who I will tell you are on their way to heaven. I don't doubt that. Who only believe in the first and the last one. They don't believe for whatever reason the middle one is still pertinent for today. But when you see that the three feasts were all part of the same calendar year and all mandated that they were all supposed to appear at every year, by what right do we have to take one of those feasts out and say, well, that died away with the apostles? Then why didn't the other two die away with the apostles? I'm just saying this is something that we've got to look at as the church. If you've been afraid of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because someone has told you it's not scriptural or it's not for today, I'm trying to provide a foundation that would provide you with a different understanding of scripture. And by the way, a person who has had an experience, Smith Wigglesworth used to say, is not at the mercy of someone who just has an argument. I've had an experience with being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in a language that I have not learned. So all of the arguments that exist out there that says that my experience died out with the apostles, I have to scoff at because I've had an experience, so I'm not at the mercy of your argument. Amen. Praise the Lord. Preach it. All right. All right. There we go. We're all still friends, though. We're all still friends. So Leviticus chapter 23 details all of these different feasts all in one chapter. Okay? These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the time appointed. I don't have the scripture on the screen, but I want you to go and read through Leviticus chapter 23. I'm just going to highlight a, first, uh, a few things. So you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread celebrated on the 15th of the month. Okay, and then you skip down and in this passage in Leviticus chapter 23, it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it, and on the day when you wave the bread, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord, and the grain offering shall be with it, so on and so forth, all the way through, okay? It's that waving of that first sheaf I want to talk about for just a moment. This is in Passover, Jesus' crucifixion, okay? Well, we know Passover, right? Salvation? Okay, all right. Resurrection Day, all of those things we're about to celebrate. So, on the day after Passover, you have Passover the day after. Keep in mind, day start, evening to morning, okay? So, you've got the Sabbath starting in the evening, and then uh, uh, the sundown, and then all the way to the next morning. Uh, so, on the day after the Passover, they had a sheaf of barley. Barley was the first grain that was harvested in the agricultural community. This grain had been thrashed. Well, first of all, let me back up. The day before, this barley sheaf, you know, it gets right before the wheat does. So the barley sheaf had been cut, separated from the earth. It had been taken and thrashed. Okay, threshed. The chaff had gone away. You leave the kernels of the barley behind. And then it had been pounded. And then it had been sifted until it was made into pure flour. It is that sifting that is taken then and it is waved before the Lord on the following day. Okay, are you, are you following me here? The waving of the sheaf of the first fruits corresponds to Jesus being cut off from the earth in his death, his crucifixion, being in the tomb, and then his resurrection. He's lifted up and he's waved before the Lord as being accepted now as the first fruits of those who are going to rise from the dead. Amen? Amen. All right. So this is all built into the word of God. You could not, I'm telling you, you could not have written this out thousands of years prior 
and then had a man's life match this to such a degree. You could not have done it, especially with multiple authors over thousands of years writing and uh, uh, inscribing down the Word of God as the Spirit of God is delivering it to him. It boggles the mind how detailed, complex, and accurate the Word of God is. From time to time, you'll hear about Nostradamus. He's making the rounds again, and uh, they're going to hold all kinds of Discovery Channel specials on his prophecies and so on and so forth. And I think they said there was somewhere around 900 prophecies that he had in his lifetime, and they're all geeking out because if you look right and you stand on your head and turn sideways and squint one eye, they say that maybe 40% of his prophecies have somehow, they think, come true. And I'm like, they're geeking out over a gentleman who had at most, at the highest, let's give him the 40% success rate for just a moment. At most, he had a 40% success rate. You have thousands of prophecies listed in the Word of God, and not one of them has fallen to the ground. Every one of them, 100% accurate, foretold sometimes thousands of years before it actually occurred. That's something to geek out about and get excited about, okay? So... Um, so here we are. We move from the Passover to the weeks, the Feast of Weeks, Feast of Pentecost, representing the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You have 50 days after Passover, and then Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15 says this. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you bring the bundle of grain to be lifted up as a special offering, count off seven full weeks. Seven weeks is what? How many days? 49, right? From the day after. So the day after you had that day, that's 50 days right there. Keep counting until the day after the seventh day, the Sabbath, 50 days later. Then present an offering of new grain. This isn't the old offering that happened at salvation. Are you hearing this? Here we go. The original testament is going to blow out of the water. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit when I got saved. Okay? You're going to bring a new offering 50 days later. Two offerings. Two wavings before God. This is a new offering. Bring two loaves of bread to be lifted up before the Lord as a special offering. They were to wait 50 days, present a new offering. This is not the same barley flour that was made two months ago. There is an original testament pattern of two separate experiences, salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have no right to combine those into one in the New Testament. Let it sink in. This is not saying that you cannot get saved and then fill with the Holy Spirit on the same day. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying salvation and having the Spirit of God come into your heart and life is not the same thing as being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, this is one of the reasons that we separate this experience of salvation. Acts chapter 1 Verses 1 through 6. I produced the former account, O Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given orders to the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after he suffered with many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking the things about the kingdom of God. And while he was with them, he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what was promised by the Father, which you heard about from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So why would he be talking about a baptism in the Holy Spirit if they were filled with the Holy Spirit when Jesus rose from the dead, entered into that room and breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If that receiving of the Holy Spirit was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why would he be saying, Wait in Jerusalem for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Was Jesus crazy? I don't think so. He knew what he was talking about. There are two experiences. Again, I'm not trying to condemn anyone. I'm not trying to make someone feel bad. I'm trying to get the church to walk in the fullness of what God has provided for us and called us into. He has called us into a deeper relationship of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in the same place. Now, I've skipped around a little bit here. We're getting back to our subject of unity. The budding early church gathered in unity of praise and prayer and the days leading up to Pentecost. This unity in prayer does not mean that everyone was a clone of each other. 
Now, I've heard it said we've all got to walk in unity, and that means everybody's got to think the same way, believe the same doctrine, like the same things, do the same stuff, so on and so forth. That is not unity from a scriptural standpoint. Okay, those are mind-numbed robots. It doesn't mean you're, we're going to have unity. We're all going to like the same foods and dress the same way and, and look at Scripture the same way. And if you aren't looking at Scripture the same way that I do or that pastor does or whatever, well, then we're not walking in love and walking in unity. No, that's not what the Word of God is saying. So let's take some of that pressure off and let's step back a little bit. So why is this mentioned first off in, in, in Acts? They were all together in one accord or they were all in unity in one spot. Why is this mentioned as a component of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Okay, that's what we've got to ask our, our question. All sound doctrine has its root in uh, Genesis, which is the book of beginnings. And uh, all sound doctrine has types and shadows within Genesis. So let's turn to Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. Now the whole world had one language and the same words. Do you know that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them with the same language? Convenient, right? Otherwise, Adam and Eve would not know how to communicate with each other. And uh, as we all know, communication is very important in any marriage. Yeah. Amen. All right. So uh, that would be, a, that would be a setting them up for, for failure instead of success. So uh, follow that through. For the first thousand years or so, uh, plus, you have everybody speaking the same language. So we're past Noah here. So we're well under 1,500, 1,800 years. For 1,800 years on the face of the earth, everybody's saying the same thing. No matter where you traveled on the planet, everybody's speaking the exact same language. So as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Babylon. Okay. And they said to each other, come, let us make bricks, burn them thoroughly. They had a brick for stone. They had tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. And in that city, a tower whose top reaches to heaven. This is no different than what Eve did. She saw the fruit. She saw it. It looked good. She believed that it had the power to make her know right from wrong for herself I can now decide what's right and what's wrong, just like God. That's the temptation. The temptation was not, I'm hungry and there's a piece of fruit and I'm going to eat it. There is fruit everywhere. The temptation that Satan used against her is the same temptation that he uses against each one of us. And that is to elevate ourselves that we know best what to do with our lives, that we know best what is right and what is wrong for us in our generation. And all of us have failed that miserably. So now you have a whole group of people moving out to Babylon. We're going to build a city with that identity. That's why Babylon is mentioned in Revelation as being judged. It's not necessarily talking about a physical city called Babylon. Okay, It's talking about that world system that started back in Genesis 11 that said, let us gather together and we will be a God unto ourselves. We will build a city so magnificent it will always stand and we will build within that city a tower that will reach itself to heaven. What are they saying? They're saying we are going to rise on up and be in heaven with all the gods. That's the story. That's what the individuals were trying to do. So God sees that. It says the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that humankind was building. The Lord sees everything. Okay. So there he is. He's seeing everything. And the Lord said, behold, look, they are one people with one language. He's saying, I gave them unity and I gave them one language to keep that unity. And how do they repay me? They unify themselves against me. That's what he's always going to judge. I don't care what corporation. I don't care what government. I don't care what group of governments all get together and decide God doesn't exist. I'm going to make money. Uh, greed is going to be my God. I'm going to move the economy forward. I'm going to uh, enact this. I'm going to say that it's okay to kill the unborn. I'm going to say it's okay to uh, murder those that are elderly. I'm going to say it's able to do that. I mean, all of the unholy, un they can all agree that all of these principles are real. All these principles are, too, are true. And God looks at it and says, let us see the city that they're building. You see, they're using their unity. They're using their unity 
to rebel against God. So they're all one people, one language. It's only the beginning of what they will do. God's right about that. So now nothing that they intend to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. Plural. The giant uh, you there means that he's talking uh, uh, to the triune uh, self there of God. Let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand each other's language. So the Lord scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. For there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth and there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. See, unity that is put together to defy God isn't pleasing to God. Whether it's in the church or out of the church, whether it's the people of God or those that aren't the people of God, it doesn't matter how many people you have on your side believing like you do. If you are setting yourself up to rebel against the word of God, you are no different than Babel. Sin always divides, but God always unites what has been divided. Sin will always divide. It does when it works itself out in a church. What does sin do? It gets in the heart, then it starts talking about how different people are. What is it that you hear politically? I mean, look, look listen, listen, guys. Let's, let's not be ignorant of Satan's devices. Whenever you have a politician or anyone else standing up and dividing people on the basis of race, on the basis of economics, the 1% versus those that have not, Okay, it's division. Division is always of the devil. Amen. It pits people against each other. It's tribalism. Yeah. Those overseas, you know what I'm talking about. Tribalism isn't just confined to Africa. It's not just confined to India with a caste system. It's in the West uh, just as well. They just have different tribes for different things. They have different, uh, 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 different uh, names for them. But anything that sets itself up to talk about things from a divisive standpoint, whether it be slander or gossip, you, you understand something. Slander in Scripture, see, in, in legal terms, slander, I've told you this already, I think. Slander in legal terms here in the West means that uh, uh, it has to be something said that's degrading, that's not true. Okay? In the Bible, it doesn't mean that. In the Bible, it means you are saying something to divide or injure or to tear down someone else. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. You are espousing information that you know is going to hurt somebody else. You are being divisive. This is, you look at the epistles, you look at the words of the Spirit of God through Paul and through Peter and through John. They spend a great deal of time talking about disunity in the church. Why? Because Satan is terrified that the church is going to begin to bind up the gaps and fill these things in and begin to unite people together under building the kingdom of God and seeing souls birthed in the kingdom of God, coming alive, being converted, living holy before God and living in the power of God. Satan is terrified of that because he and the world have no answers against that so he comes in the church he comes into politics he comes into uh, individuals hearts anything that is divisive in your heart in your marriage etc 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 is sin Whew. you can hear a pin drop all over the world so what starts in a garden listen to this god unites what has been divided so God takes those things that are ruined and he makes them whole again, right? The Bible starts in a garden and where does it end in Revelation? A new city, new Jerusalem coming down and there are the trees that are there on the either side of that river of life that's walking through. It ends in a garden. See, God hasn't changed his mind about what he wanted. What he wanted, what he created, he saw it and it was what? Good, right? So it's good. He says, why do I have to redo it? I don't want to redo it. That's still good. It hasn't changed the definition of good. We've just marred that. We've just destroyed that. What's he going to do? He's going to end this world on his terms and he's going to set it back up again as good all over again. This is what he's doing. He's restoring the thing that had been divided. When Jesus birthed the church then, they were all together in one place with one heart. This does not mean everybody on the planet was all together. This does not mean that everybody believed the same, thought the same, felt the same, okay? This means Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost had come, 
They were all together in the same place. Suddenly a sound like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting, and divided tongues like fire appeared to them and rested upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages or tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak out. So what Satan had divided, God then united again with a common language, the language of the Spirit. He divided people by dividing their tongues so that they would not be able to rebel successfully. It would stay them for a while. And then he united his church, his people again, by unifying our language under the language of the Spirit of God. In Acts... And I'll say it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of titles say in your Bible, the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts really have very little to do with the Apostles. They have everything to do with the Spirit of God. Okay? Amen. The church becomes united by the Spirit of God and power through the outpouring of the Spirit of God with the evidence of tongues. This is why Satan fights so hard against tongues. Because he knows it is a unifying factor for the body of Christ. And even those in Pentecost are often frightened of tongues. Oh, what will guests think? What will guests think? Well, they'll think that something different is happening here. They'll think the same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost. They'll say, these men are drunk. These men are mad. And Peter stands up and uses the ridicule and the scorn and says, this is not that. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It's come to pass. You guys know it's been in the writings with stammering lips and another tongue while I speak to my people. This is what God had promised and we've just experienced it. It's the fruition of Scripture. It's the fulfillment of the Spirit of God speaking through Isaiah, speaking through Moses. It's the fulfillment of what we've been waiting for. See, this is what God wants the church to say today into a world that says, but no, we're afraid. Oh, what will happen? What will happen if, if we all speak in tongues and people come in and maybe they're Baptists and we want them to come to our church. We believe what we have is right, but they don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the, uh, the outpouring of speaking in tongues. Oh no, what will we do? They'll see something. They'll know it's genuine. They'll feel the presence of God and they'll say, we want to have this same experience. See, we don't need to apologize for it. We need to say, I can show you my experience in scripture. Can you show me yours? I, I, okay, this is just where I am. This is just what I believe here. I know this might be groundbreaking, but I'm, I'm just saying. This is why Satan fights tongues so very hard. This is why he fights the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is why he fought against me receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit for years. It's why I had to get out of my head and into my heart and surrender uh, my, my, my tongue. I've heard it said by many people. I don't know who said it first. I don't think anybody really knows. But I've heard it said, look, because uh, people say that the, 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 the church of today, a lot of the churches of today say, well, tongues is of the devil. You heard that before? Okay, tongues is of the devil. So look, I've heard a lot of people say this. So this isn't original. It's not me. Uh, they say something like this. If tongues is of the devil, I would have found it years ago when I wasn't living right. Because I found everything else that the devil had to offer. You know, so if tongues are the devil, I would have found it when I wasn't living uh, right, uh, uh, way before I got saved. So uh, we have to look at the scripture. Our experience has to match scripture. But when it does, we don't need to apologize for that experience. We don't need to backpedal. We don't need to say, well, I don't want you to say, because what do people say? Oh, you're Pentecostal? Does that mean you guys speak in tongues? You need to say, absolutely we do. Just like the Bible says, and if you come, the Spirit of God will baptize you as well, and you will have that same experience of unification and glory and joy in your heart just like I do. That needs to be the response of the church, not, well, you know, sometimes somebody does, but it's okay, it'll last for a little bit, and you know, you don't have to be weirded out by anything. And what have you just told them? You've told them the baptism of the Holy Spirit means nothing to you. Yes. Wow. So, let's continue here, because th there's, there's, there's some, I, we got a lot of stuff to do. We got a lot of stuff. So, Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain that is called the Olive Grove, or the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. 
And when they had entered, they went up to the upstairs room or the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, uh, zealot and Judas the son of James. All these were busily engaged with one mind in prayer, okay, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the brothers and it was a crowd of persons of about 120 in the same place. And he said, and so what I, I'm just, I'm going to stop the scripture there because that's, that's for my purposes. That's what I needed to say. So how many of you have heard the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened in the upper room? Okay. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm sorry. It did not happen in the upper room. And we're going to go through that here for just a moment. And I'm going to tell you why it matters. Okay, here's why it matters. So what we just read is talking about the ascension of Christ on the Mount of Olives outside. They all watched that. Some 500 of them watched Jesus ascend. Okay? Now, in those intervening days, from the time Jesus ascended till the day of Pentecost, we have 10 days. Read the scripture. They returned to Jerusalem, which was a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered, they went into the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon, <gasps> Judas the son of James. Okay? Period. New sentence. All these were busily engaged with one mind in prayer together with the women. Now, if they're staying in an upper room, there's a lot of people who say there's no way the women would have been in that room. That's not their home. That was, uh, this is talking about a separate thing. Okay, they're busily engaged with one mind. And in those days, so this isn't on that day. In those days, in those intervening 10 days, Peter stands up in the midst of the brothers, a crowd of people now about 120. You aren't going to get 120 people in any upper room in Jerusalem. This is a house. They say, oh, they spilled over onto the rooftop. I'm going to explain to you why that, that didn't happen, okay? Uh, b b 120 that are there. What's he talking about? They're electing or, or putting Matthias back in as one of the apostles. There needs to be 12, someone who was there from the beginning. Judas had killed himself. And so in those intervening days, they get with 420 and say, let's cast lots. Let's decide what the will of God is for who's going to fulfill this position. Period. The end of chapter 1. Chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one accord in one place. Now, let's go through here, okay? Day of Pentecost has arrived. It's one of the three feasts, right? People are gathered from all over the world to be at that feast. Where are they at the time of the morning sacrifice? At the temple. They're there to see the sacrifice on the day of Pentecost. So when it says these men are not drunk as you are supposed being it is but the third hour of the day, it's nine o'clock. He's telling us that's the time of the morning sacrifice. Where are all of these people? They are in the temple. That's why all of them were able to hear who had gathered from all over. They stood up in the middle of the temple. The power of God came down on the 120 that were believing in Christ as the risen Savior. They were waiting in Jerusalem until God had spoken. But they were always in the temple for every festival, for every feast. Today would have been no different, especially not today. It's Pentecost. There they are. That's where the fire of God fell down. And that's where the fire of God moved upon them, signifying that the Spirit of God or the presence of God was no longer in the tabernacle of Moses, no longer saying, I'll meet you in the temple of Solomon, but now I am restoring what had been broken from the garden forward, what I have been trying to put back together in that intimacy with Adam and in that intimacy with Eve. Now the temple of God will be inside of the hearts of of humankind. That's why Peter stands up and says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, that upon your sons and daughters, free and those that have enslaved, rich and poor, male and female, will I pour my spirit upon all flesh. And he talks about all the benefits of that relationship. This is God coming back in and saying, are you impressed yet that I took what Satan had ruined and destroyed and over the years I have built it back together in unity with the outcome pouring of the Spirit of God and with a new language to boot. Filled all the house where they were sitting. People say, oh, the house, oh, that's there. <clears throat> that's speaking of the upper room. Let me tell you, Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. Was he talking about the upper room or the temple? 
It's talking about the temple. It's the same word translated here. We don't have any hangups in any other way. I'm going to add one more thing, okay? Because I, I just like, you know, extra proof for those who are out there. I just don't believe in that, you know. Okay, <laughs> extra proof. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 12 and 14. And all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, Jeduthun, their sons, their brothers, dressed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, stringed instruments. They were standing to the east of the altar. So Second Chronicles chapter 5 is the outpouring of the Spirit of God into the temple of Solomon. You ready for this? And with them outside were 120 priests who were trumpet blowers. And it was the primary duty of the trumpeters and the singers to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and give thanks to Yahweh. And when a sound from the trumpet, cymbals, and other instruments of song was raised to Yahweh, for he is good, because his loyal love is everlasting. Then the house, the house of Yahweh, was filled with a cloud, and the priests were not able to stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh filled the house of God. Do you see this at the dedication of the temple of Solomon? It's the exact same thing. God says the tabernacle was Moses. The more permanent structure was there was Solomon, but that has never been my goal. You are not supposed to have to meet with me at a house or to meet with me at a temple in Jerusalem. I have wanted to dwell in inside of you. Ephesians chapter 2 says that God is building mankind again to be a dwelling of God in the spirit. This is what God has been after. This is what God has been after. That when you allow your heart to be unified with God, when you gather together and begin to praise God, when you loose your tongue with a trumpet sounding of a voice, and when you are praising Him, God will fill you. And just as they said on the day of Pentecost, the men couldn't stand they thought they were drunk. There was an outpouring of the Spirit of God that gave them physical manifestations of acting like they had been a little loopy, a little tipsy, and that's what they accused them of. This is God saying, it's nothing more than my presence, and it's no different than the original Testament outpouring in the tabernacle of Moses where the priest couldn't enter, and in the taber of temple of Solomon where the 120 and the priest could not stand. You don't have to apologize for the phenomena of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now there's flesh, I'm telling you, there's flesh that's out there. I believe, I've seen it over and over again of people that get so excited and they go through and they, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. And that should not be tolerated in the house of God. But neither should it be that we get rid of everything because we're afraid of a little flesh. I believe God is able to take care of his church. And one of the markers of the people of God are there are people who are overcome and led by the Spirit of God. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the proof that God is now dwelling with you and in you. It is the proof that God is now dwelling with you and in you. The word tabernacle in the original testament means to dwell with. It's the visible presence of God on the camp of Israel. Now God is saying that visible presence is on you. I don't want it to be in a tent. I don't want it to be in a building. I want it to be in you. You see, when we give God the best that we have to offer, that's what a sacrifice of praise means, by the way. A sacrifice of praise does not mean, oh, well, I didn't really feel like it, but I did it anyway. I sacrificed, you know, my own feelings. for. That's not a sacrifice. A sacrifice is the best. Yeah. A sacrifice is you take something that is precious to you. You take something that means the world to you. You take the first and you take the best and you offer it up to God. Yeah. You offer it up to God. Thank you. So, um, I think I'm out of... Uh, let me see what I've got here. I'm, I'm skipping down through my notes. Bear with me for just a moment because I, uh, I think I skipped some verses in here. Did I? Delisha, did I skip verses in here? Because I want to get to the first fruits. Well, where's my scriptures on the first fruits? Boom, boom, boom. Where's my scripture on the first fruits? Man, I don't see it. All right, so this may be out of order, but I'm going to do it here anyway because I don't want to forget about this. Um, 
Where is that? First Corinthians chapter uh, 15. I don't have the, uh, I don't have it in there. I thought for sure I put this in here. All right, I'm going to go through. I think, I think I've got it later on. I think I've got it later on. I just can't find it right now. So, we've cried out for revival for ages. Our prayer has got to be, let revival come as it is poured out by God without alteration. We cannot be afraid of what God is going to do. I, I've said over and over again for years, that when you stand before God at an altar, any altar, you have to remind yourself, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it sounds like. I don't care what it feels like. I don't care if God makes me a spectacle or not. You know, some people want the spectacle and some people don't. All right. Uh, I don't care which ends it's on. I'm not after anything. I just want you as you want to be poured out in this generation. You see, the Word of God tells us in the original Testament, the latter house will be greater than the former. You see how fantastic the outpouring of the Spirit of God was on the day of Pentecost. What's going to be greater? What are we going to allow God to do inside of us? So this is what we change and alter our prayer life to enjoy. This is what we, we change and alter our prayer life so that we come into the house of God and we're saying, Spirit of God, this is exactly what we need. This is exactly what we, 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 we have, to, uh, uh, have to be a part of in the house of God. I, I know what you did in the original Testament. I know how phenomenal it was. Today, to today let us be in awe of your glory. Yes. Today, do something that will cause the world to sit back and their jaws will drop. Yes. And they will look and say, the Lord, he is good. The Lord, he is faithful. The Lord, he is awesome. His love is everlasting. Do something that is worthy of your character. When you're walking around the sanctuary at Radiant Life Church or your churches uh, uh, overseas there in, in your cities in Mumbai and in Kampala, when you're walking around your churches, do something, Lord. Do exploits that are worthy of your essence. Do something that is beyond my comprehension, not just so that I can see something, not just so that I can, I can say, oh, look at what God's done and I can tag along with your glory, but do something because the world still needs to see who you are. The world is trying to define God and say he doesn't exist and say, oh God, if he does exist, doesn't care about you and doesn't love you and can't rescue you and can't save you. I'm tired of the world that has rejected God, the world of Babel. I am tired of Babel on defining who God is. The church should be defining who God is according to the word of God by saying, Spirit of God, come again and step down and rend the heavens and let your fire come and the world may mock, the world may ridicule, but let them come and see something that they have never seen before and experience something they have never felt before and say that it is the Lord and he is good. That is what the church should be about. Revival will always address the brokenness of the age. Revival will always address the brokenness of the age. For what specifically is broken in a region or in an area or in a world, the revival will address that need. Why? Because sin disunifies, sin destroys, ten, sin tears down. God builds things up in unity again. So when God steps in in revival, he knows how to take what's shattered and make it right again. Yeah. Now, I, I'll tell you this. If you were to start right now in your neighborhood and go door to door, and if you could see into the spiritual condition of every individual in your neighborhood, and you knew how broken they were, the experiences of their childhood that let fear in and let depression in and let discouragement in and let sickness in, let disease in, the warped minds of Antichrist, all of the things that are tied up inside of their hearts and minds and life. If you could see in that and you were just to set yourself to pray for that individual and to tear those things down, to counsel them through getting rid of those old tapes and those old memories and teaching and convincing them that the Spirit of God loves them and will rescue them and make things new again. How long do you think it would take you to see one person brought into the kingdom of God and fully converted? Years. 
Well, they call them counselors today, and people go to counseling for 10, 15 years, and, and they're still broken. And the counselor eventually says, and I'm not saying all counselors do this, I don't need the hate mail, uh, please take this for what it's worth, but the counselor says, I can't fix it, but I can give you a pill that will help deaden it so you won't feel it as much. So that you can function, so that you can, uh, you can walk through life. But when a revival comes, the Spirit of God steps into that same community and without all of the other drama and all of the other difficulty, the Spirit of God comes in and melts away the barriers and melts away with heat that says melts the hills like heat and a flame melts a candle. He comes in and takes those things that have been rock hard barriers of hearts that are resistant to God and minds that are resistant to God and families and husbands and wives that have been resistant to God and kids that are rebellious against God. And in one moment, he takes those things and he busts them down with a fire of intensity and the walls fall down and they cry out, what must I do to be saved? Just like happened on the day of Pentecost. Keep in mind, the crowd that gathered, the 3,000, they were part of the same crowd that seven weeks earlier nailed Jesus to a cross and said, crucify him. He is not our Lord. We will not have this man rule over him. And one sermon in 15 seconds spoken by Peter under the anointing of an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And they're ripping their clothes and they're saying, what must I do to be saved? That's the revival that we're looking for. And that's the power of intercession when we begin to unite our prayer in tongues as the Spirit of God begins to lift up the prayer. He knows what needs to be prayed in our communities. He knows what needs to be prayed through us. He knows how to transform us. We just have to let Him do it. Now, tongues are provided by God for unification. However, the devil will attempt to create division. The devil will attempt to continue to create division. Now, it's semantics, but technically it's not tongues that divides people. It's the opposition to tongues that divides people. I, I know it's semantics, but it's an important, it's an important thing. Uh, the tongues was there for unification, and the church needs to always remember that so that we aren't backpedaling in those conversations. So, when the Spirit of God is released, threefold activity. Number one is conviction. John chapter 16, verse 8, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, of God's righteousness, and the coming judgment. Three things that are necessary right there for conversion. Conviction of sin. Sin is what God says it is, not what you or the world define it as. Of righteousness. That's saying that there is a holy standard and that Jesus is it. He is the righteousness of God. Amen? There is, there is no other. Okay? So not only does it say, here's what sin is, it says, here's who Jesus is. He is the standard of righteousness. And third, he causes us to be born again. He causes us to be born again or to be converted. So that's the activity of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, verse 5 through 8 says, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. You know, you must be born again. That's where he's telling Nicodemus. Okay, so it's the Spirit of God that causes an individual to be born again. All three of those elements... Which of those can we do without in the church? None of them. It's not a trick question. None of them. That's the work of the Spirit. But we don't see that. Our conversions are what? They're intellectual conversions. We convince someone with the power of our words that the Bible is true. And we do that, and then what happens? Somebody else comes along and convinces them later that God isn't real and God isn't true. But when someone has been converted or born again by the Spirit of God, it's not a head conversion. It's not a mental conversion. It's a whole life conversion of the body. It brings us into the family of God. Galatians 4, 6, Because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 9, However you are not in the flesh, but the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. Anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Okay, so this also is saying that being born again, there is a measure of the Spirit that's giving to you. Jesus comes into the upper or into the room that they're in. He walks through the, the walls there. He, they touch his, his uh, hands. See the scars there? Touch his side. They believe it's him. And he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And they are born again. They're believing in the resurrected Savior. Right? So the Spirit of God is there. 
But that's not the same thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I am urging individuals who have not yet been filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I am urging them to press through. There is power. And you say, well, what's the difference? Can you get to heaven without it? Absolutely, you can get to heaven without it. But why would you want to? Why would you want to miss out on any experience that Christ has given you, that God has given you, when you see from Genesis through Revelation how much speaking in other tongues has been a part of God's plan for His body from the beginning? Paul spoke in tongues. Peter spoke in tongues. Stephen spoke in tongues. Philip spoke in tongues. Timothy, John, the Corinthian church spoke in tongues. They all spoke in tongues. Why would we oppose them? Why would we say it was acceptable for them and all of them needed it, but we don't need it? Based on what information? By what authority would we declare it to be finished? The word baptize, you get baptized in water. It means to be overwhelmed or to whelm over with water, to be immersed. It's an immersion. So you're immersed in water, you're baptized in water. You're immersed in the Spirit of God. You're overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. It's a measure of control. It's a measure of surrender. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5 talks about one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 13, being baptized into one body. A description of salvation there. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a release of the Spirit that is already within us at salvation. It releases Him to minister. It releases Him to pray. It releases Him to allow those gifts that God has given the body that are resident when the Holy Spirit is there to be let loose within us. They're His gifts gifts to be distributed as he wills for whatever situation arises so let's go back and let's let's try and put this all together there are types of salvation in the original testament and baptism of the holy spirit there are types of these things in the original testament are being separated genesis chapter 2 verse 7 when the lord formed the man of dust from the ground he blew into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature Right? In effect, that's no different than Jesus in that room breathing on them and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. They're becoming born again. Breathed into them and Adam became alive. Then Jesus, God, breathed into them and they were dead in their sins and they became alive because they believed in the risen Savior. Okay, it's a new creation. It's a new birth. Okay, John chapter 20, verse 19. Uh, oh, that's the one we just, uh, that we just read. That's the reference for that, by the way. John 20, 19 through 23. Okay, Passover. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. In the first month, 14th of the day, the month of twilight, the Lord's Passover. Okay, salvation. Pentecost. Leviticus 23, 15 and 16. It's 10 verses later. You shall count for yourselves from the day after Sabbath, from the day when you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. There shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's not an old offering. It is a, uh, uh, it, it is a, it is a, a new offering. Um, and we'd already, uh, already discussed that. Let me look down here real quick. You know, I apologize because I have messed this up with my scripture references. I've just confirmed it. Um, Let me here talk about the first fruits for just a moment. And I'm apologizing because I don't, I'm not going to have those scripture references at the ready. Um, There were two that I had written. I'll I'll try and um, and post them on uh, on the video so that you can see them later. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 15, talking about the resurrection. It says, when Jesus rose from the dead, he is a first fruits or a type of <clears throat> first fruits of those that rose from the dead. Okay? They are literally telling the church that in the original testament where that first fruit was waved of the sheaf, you know, it's saying it's been cut off from the ground, it's been thrashed, it's been harvested, it's been pounded, it's been sifted into fine flour and presented before God. It is talking about Jesus being our first fruits of raised from the dead. That's what he's done. Cut off from the earth. He was, he was wounded for our iniquities. He was scourged. He was beaten. Uh, he, he went through the trials of Gethsemane and the trials of his earthly ministry for three years. And then he ascended into heaven saying that he was pleased or God was pleased with him because he was weighed before the Lord. As such, he is the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. What does that mean? It means there is a harvest yet to come. 
It means there is a harvest yet to come of which you and I are a part. Amen? You and I are a part of this. Okay, so uh, let, let, let's continue then. Blood and oil uh, used to cleanse the leper is talked about in Leviticus chapter 14, verses 14 through 17. In Leviticus, we're talking about leprosy from a standpoint of it's a, it's a type of sin as it permeates through the body. Okay, I don't have time to go into it. I don't have time to preach on it, but that's what it is. To cleanse the leper, you're going to love this. To cleanse the leper, it is the exact same ritual that was used by the priest as it was to ordain a priest for priesthood. Wow. You cleanse the leper by putting them through the, the ritual to make a priest a priest. Wow. Let's talk about it. Leviticus chapter 14, verse 14 through 17. And the priest shall take some of the guilt offerings blood, and the priest shall put it on the right ear lobe of the one who presents himself for cleansing, and on his right hand's thumb... And on his right foot's big toe, right being power, the, the, the side of power, okay? And the priest shall take some of the oil, and he shall pour it on his left palm. And then the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left palm. And he shall splatter some of the oil seven times before the Lord, okay? That's before the Ark of the Covenant, before the veil that's there. He puts the oil there, signifying the oil of the Holy Spirit. Then the priest shall put some of the remaining oil, which is on his palm, on the right earlobe. So you have the blood and then the oil, two separate applications. The blood first and then the oil. Okay? This is, this is amazing. On the right earlobe, on the right thumb, and on the right foot. They removed, a leper was removed from the congregation until cleansed. They were excommunicated from the camp of Israel. They couldn't be inside. Uh, we are that leper. We are that Gentile that is outside the camp and can't come in. We are the ones that have been ostracized by God because of our rebellion. We're the ones that built the city in Babylon saying, let's rebel against God. And yet God in his mercy has welcomed us back, not as an individual that has no rights within his kingdom, but as a priest. He takes us with the guilt offering and he applies the blood to our ear that the things that you hear again are going to be different than the things things you heard when you were growing up, the tapes that you heard that said you had no worth, that said you had no value, that said that you were a mistake, that said you weren't smart enough, you weren't handsome enough, you weren't good enough, you weren't talented enough, you've been passed over. All of those things you heard, he puts the blood there and says, hear the voice of the word of the Lord. I have made you. You are fearfully made. You are wonderfully made. You are who I say you are. And then he takes that blood and he cleanses it with the right thumb and he says this thumb the things that you are going to do before they may have failed before they may not have worked out well before they may have fallen apart but now it's sanctified by the blood no longer leprous no longer sinful no longer shameful and then wherever you walk in the journey that I've called you to right there the big toe it's on there it's the blood but he doesn't stop with the blood of cleansing he takes the oil of the spirit of God and he says it's not enough to be cleansed and then left on your own because the heart is deceitfully wicked. The things that you are to do can only be done in the power of the Spirit of God. So he takes the oil of the Spirit of God and he begins to say now on your ear let your ears be open to hear the voice of God and the moving of the Spirit of God. He'll tabernacle with you. He'll speak with you in your prayer life. He'll speak with you in a new language and then he puts it on the thumb and says there's an anointing to do the things that I've asked you to do and called you to do an anointing to go in the way that I've called you to go this is the will of God for his people from Genesis all the way through Revelation glory to God glory to God you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1 and 5 I do not want you to be ignorant brothers that our fathers were all under the cloud and all went through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses. In the cloud and in the sea. Two places they were baptized. In the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. All had drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. The rock was Christ. But God was not pleased with the majority of them. For they were struck down in the desert. A lot of things here that we got to consider. 
Being filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean, nor does it make you immune to sin. We need to understand that. It's a new life and it's a new opportunity, but it does not make you immune. It does not mean that you have a... There are many people who have spoken in other tongues and who've been filled with the Holy Spirit that unfortunately are going to split the lake of fire wide open. The Lord is saying that it's for those who are obedient and for those who follow after Him and for those who understand what the gifts and the calling of God are about and why we're united again through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, those are the individuals that are going to be able to make it out of the wilderness and into the promised land and the Feast of Tabernacles. Pentecostal experiences in Scripture. Luke, Jesus was born of the Spirit. Luke chapter 1, verse 35, The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Jesus was born of the Spirit, right? Then Jesus was baptized in the Spirit. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. A voice came out of heaven saying, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. He did not begin his public ministry until he was baptized in the Spirit and tested. Two separate experiences, born in the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit. Apostles, remember John 20, he breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit on resurrection evening. Subsequent on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus had two experiences. The early church had two experiences. Why don't we still have two experiences? The desire of Christ was for believers to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 24, verse 40, 45 and 49, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, thus it is written that Christ would suffer, rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He's saying, wait for that second experience. Now, keep in mind, these individuals had already gone out and done miracles. They'd already gone out and healed the sick. They'd already gone out and said, we, we are excited that demons uh, are subject to us in your name. And yet, the Spirit of God was necessary for them to continue in ministry. I want to say one more thing. Well, I'm going to say three or four more things. Who am I kidding? <laughs> the baptism of the Holy Spirit is proof to the believer that Jesus is where he says he is. In John chapter 14, what does he say? I'm going away. Where I'm going, you can't come to me. But when I get to my father, I'm going to send the comforter with you. I'm going to send him to you. He is now with you and will be in you. You see the two separate experiences now. He's with you. He's going to be in you. Okay, this is what he's talking about. When the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes 10 days after the ascension, it's proof that not only Jesus was accepted for our sin, or that not only that he ascended, but that he was accepted by the Father on behalf of our sin. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have come. It's proof that Jesus was telling the truth. I've made it to the Father. The Spirit of God has been dispatched. And I'm telling you, it's righteous now between you and God. It's proof. So when you see someone, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're speaking other tongues, it's not just the unification. It's not just the unity of the language. It's all of those things put together for the power of God. And then you have the day of Pentecost. That's the outpouring in Jerusalem. And then you have Judea and Samaria, right? You should be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So Acts chapter 2 is Jerusalem. Acts chapter 8 in the beginning, and then also in 8, 5 through 18, you have Samaria, okay? Judea and Samaria. That's where... Uh, Philip goes down to the city, city of Samaria, begins preaching, and the baptism fell there. And they begin to speak in other tongues. That's where Simon saw what was going on and said, what in the world's happening here? And, and he wanted the gift of uh, people being rece following, uh, uh, receiving the Holy Spirit. And then you have Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles in Caesarea. That's the uttermost parts of the world. Okay, you have uh, uh, um, the house of uh, Cornelius. They're all there. And uh, Peter was still speaking these words. The Holy Spirit fell upon all them who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How do they know? For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. 
And then Peter said, surely nobody can refuse them water. They had been refusing them water baptism into the church because they're Gentiles. We can't accept these guys into the church. And God says, uh, boom. And they're like, they're speaking in tongues. They're united. What the world was trying to destroy, they've had the same experience. It means we're on the same side. We've got to work together. We can't refuse them water anymore. They've got to be baptized and brought into the church. So it's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 6. Apollos is there in Corinth. Paul passed through in the upper country in Ephesus. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, if it only came when you believed, why would, uh, why would he be asking the question? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they're like, uh, no, we have not even heard if there is the Holy Spirit. And he said, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was coming after that. That is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, water baptized. There's an experience there. And then when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. The uttermost parts of the world. This is the plan of God and uniting the body of Christ together through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and through tongues. It fulfilled the Feast of Weeks, the second feast, saying our offering of first fruit to the Lord was acceptable. I will tell you, the news for the church is this. Passover has been fulfilled. And it is being fulfilled and renewed in the hearts and lives of people who are converted every day. Pentecost has been fulfilled, and it is being fulfilled in the hearts and lives of believers all over the world who get filled with the Holy Spirit every day. There's one festival left. The festival of ingathering, where Jesus comes at the end of the harvest. You see, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit wasn't so that you can be super spiritual. It wasn't so that gifts could flow through you. It wasn't so that you could pray in tongues, although all of those things are important. It was so that you had power and energy and strength and mission from the Lord to finish the harvest and bring all the harvest into in gathering so that Jesus could have his house full. Wow. The 50th has got to be kept and the baptism of the Holy Spirit has got to be kept and the people of God have got to be filled with the Spirit and then filled with the Spirit again and then filled with the Spirit again and then filled with the Spirit again. You read that throughout the book of Acts. It says, and Peter, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, and the language there is very specific. It means having just been filled. It didn't mean that he was filled in the day of Pentecost and that was it. He was filled, and then he was filled again, and 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 that has got to be the experience of the church as intercessors. It is your power to let the Spirit of God begin to pray through you. It is the power that the Spirit of God can perfectly address every situation that is going on in the atmosphere. You don't have to know who's coming and what baggage they're coming with and what heartaches they have and what difficulties they had and what trouble they had getting to church in the morning and what's going on in their home life. You don't have to know. You can simply stand there in the sanctuary and say, Spirit of God, as you did in the tabernacle and as you did in the temple and as you have done in my life, I ask that you would come and ignite this sanctuary with holy fire. I ask that you would come Spirit of God and begin to move in your strength and in your anointing and then just begin to let that spiritual language flow as you lift it up to the Lord and let the Spirit of God begin to tear down walls and let the Spirit of God begin to reach out and melt hearts and let the Spirit of God begin to soften the reasoning and the logic of Antichrist that may exist there and let all the trouble with the media department and all the trouble that may come with the sound and all the trouble that may come with the praise team and all the trouble that may have been harassing our pastor that morning and throughout the week. Let all of it melt before the presence of the Lord. God is about to descend and do something glorious and wonderful and it's the intercessors that stand there as part of the 120 lifting up their voices in unison in one accord before God. Praise the Lord. This is what we do and this is what we're looking for God to do with us as a weapon of our warfare going forward. All right, we can close the video here.